So I guess it all started with um, sort of at 24 weeks. Uh oh, I'm already tearing up. Okay. So 24 weeks pregnant, so we had our 20 week ultrasound. I went to, Jeff and I went to the ultrasound. We saw our baby move. It was exciting. And as far as I knew at that point, the 20 week ultrasound to me was just an opportunity to see my baby move and it was fun and exciting and it didn't dawn on me that something would be different or wrong with my ultrasound. And then the text said anything to me. Um, my doctor didn't call me. Four weeks went by. And at that point, I actually had got transferred from my family doctor who ordered the ultrasound to my the Niagara midwives, who I love. <laughs> and so I had an appointment with them. And so in the appointment, I just answered, yeah, I had my 20-week ultrasound. Like, I didn't hear anything. I assumed no news is good news. And she's like, oh, that's weird. We didn't get it. And so in the appointment, she called my family doctor to get the results. We continued on our appointment. I left, I went to the bathroom, and um, Jen, who was the midwife who was in the appointment, um, knocked on the bathroom door and she said that you need to come back into the office. So she, um, she pulled out the report and she goes, it's gonna be okay. Um, there is a few things that we have to discuss. So the first thing is, um, he has, an, or I guess we didn't know that it was a he, but he has um, enlarged renal pelvis, choroid plexus cysts, which are sort of just cysts of fluid that happen in the brain, and a, at that point it said a possible uh, cleft lip. So um, she was super, super sweet, and I will forever feel grateful for how kind she was to me in that appointment, and she gave me a huge hug and said, okay, we're gonna make a plan. You know, if it was just one of these things, we probably wouldn't need to refer you on, but um, we probably should refer you to um, McMaster, so the children's um, program there. And so she's like, I'm gonna send the referral right away, they're gonna be in touch, and we'll figure this out. So at that point, I um, was just sort of in shock. I was actually at that appointment alone because I didn't know anything was wrong. And so drove home and so the kind of the weird, I don't know, for me, I've had certain things work out in my life that, you know, are just a little bit too perfect to be chance. So if one in 750 babies are born with a cleft lip and palate and that number is staying um, sort of steady, at that time we lived with students. And um, so I think we were living with three or four students in the house and one of the students that was living in our house, Sunita, um, who, hi Sunita. <laughs> um, so beautiful girl, inside and out, I absolutely love Sunita. When I got home from that appointment, she has a cleft lip and palate and she happened to be the only person home at that time. And so what are the chances, right? And, um, so to know that, um, you know, that she was okay and was just a huge, I don't even think I told her right away because I had so much more going on. So I guess the, you know, the first things that they said were the enlarged renal pelvis and the choroid plexus cyst. And by the time they'd gotten to the third thing, the cleft, I was like, I'll take the cleft, I'll take the cleft. So not a big deal. Um, and so they kind of said the kidney issue um, probably something that's going to work itself out. They weren't super concerned about that, but they were going to follow up and with that. Choroid plexus cysts are common in Down syndrome. And so basically they said it's not an indicator of um, Down syndrome or some of the, um, it, it is related to different conditions. But basically um, when I talked to the geneticist, he compared it to being short. So if someone is short, it doesn't mean that they have Down syndrome, but people with Down syndrome are often short. So because it's highly associated with it, it's just sort of a, a risk factor for it, and they look more into it. So my appointment with, with McMaster was about a week away, and so this was probably um, the hardest week there. And so unfortunately, Google was not my friend. <laughs> So probably the worst couple of days were um, when I started Googling um, like choroid plexus cyst, enlarged renal pelvis, um, cleft lip and pellet, and you know, what do you come up with there? So 
probably my worst night was I came up with um, trisomy 18, which is a condition where basically your baby wouldn't survive. So obviously that was my <laughs> absolute worst fear. So um, I kind of had, like I think that I had a really bad night, a couple nights, and then kind of like talked myself out and was like, no, that it's not necessarily what's going on. Like we know we have a genetic history, we've just left cleft lip and palate, and so that's probably, um, probably what's going on. Um, so then I went to my appointment at McMaster and, um, and so that's when they sort of more, I got to talk to a geneticist and look at everything. And at that point they looked at, uh, Grayson's growth and his growth was absolutely fine. So that pretty much for sure rules out things like trisomy 18 and some of the, um, chromosome disorders that I was really worried about. And so... I think that at that point I just sort of got used to the idea that my baby's going to have a cleft lip and palate and that was okay. So one of the first things that I did, and if you go back and look at my Facebook feed, um, I didn't, like family and close friends knew, but um, I, w I didn't make it public at that point, but I still had, you know, from 25 weeks on to sort of adjust to this idea. So I spent time looking at a lot of pictures with um, babies with cleft lip and palate doing tons of research. The team at McMaster was amazing and so they set you up with um, a bottle so that um, because with a cleft lip and palate you've got a hole from running from right from your nose through the roof of your mouth and so it's, they're not able to make a suction or breastfeed so they set you up with a special bottle so that you can um, bottle feed. I was able to make sure that I got a breast pump so that I could um, pump and um, sort of still breastfeed using the bottle and just looked at lots and lots of pictures. I think that we, uh, what we consider beautiful is what we're used to. So I just got used to how babies looked with cleft lip and palate and they are so beautiful. And um, so if you're watching now or watching the replay, um, you could use the hashtag all babies are beautiful and make a comment. And they are, and I, I think that, um, you know, if we're not used to something, it, it seems different, it seems scary, but um, especially from the communities, community of cleft lip and palate, after three months when your baby has that surgery, you miss their face. They sometimes they call it a wide smile because they've got like the gap there, and so they have a really, really wide smile. And you know that it's, uh, practical as you know they're um, they need to get it fixed but as a mother you you miss their face and um, yeah so I, I definitely miss Grayson's little cleft he was so handsome and cute and he was always smiling and he had this big cute wide smile that I love anyways um, so we were all prepared um, I wanted to, so I stayed with the midwives and they did want us to have a pediatrician on board just because we didn't quite know what to expect and we wanted to have Grayson evaluated right away. So I was at the, I labored at the hospital. So I did a lot of it at home and then when it was time went to the hospital and had really great um, labor. So sort of I had my ball and I bounced on my ball and then I did some sort of, uh, I walked to the halls and I would stand and I would dance with Jeff and then I would go on the toilet and then I would go back to the ball and um, and then eventually it was time to push and so had a natural really great labor, it was long, it was 28 hours and sort of as soon as he was born they were really great, they put him on my um, chest so we were able to have skin to skin right away. Then the pediatrician came in pretty quickly, um, checked checked him out, everything seemed to be good. They weighed him, he was seven pounds, three ounces, beautiful baby boy, and everything was pretty good. So I think um, within sort of, I went in at about eight in the morning and he was born in the afternoon and sort of around dinner time, we were discharged from the hospital. Um, Sue, the cleft lip and palate coordinator for McMaster, um, came down and visited, did a home visit and just made sure that we were, that the bottle feeding was going good and that he was feeding well and everything was great. Um, 
and then probably our first cleft appointment I had a few with the midwives came to come to your house and the first it was he was nine days old and so as a first-time mom I remember it took me like three hours to get out of the house I put him in the car seat I pinched him he was spitting up he pooped you know everything took me forever and I'm emotional so I get there and they ask for his health card and so I had my health card but I didn't have his health card and the lady was super rude to me and she was like well we can't help you if you don't have his health card and I was like he is nine days old and she peeked over the counter and she was like oh he's nine days old and I was like yes she's like you don't know anything and I just started bawling I was like I don't know anything <laughs> and uh Anyways, so we did, we got in to see, apparently if they want to, they can make some phone calls and get a health card number. So what had happened is at the hospital, they had given Jeff the temporary health card and he had hung on to that. And just because craziness of labor, he had never passed that to me. Anyways, it worked out. Um, and then sort of life was pretty normal. Between surgeries, we don't really think about his cleft lip and palate at all. Um, three months came up and so at three months they repaired the lip and so he had to hand over my little baby so probably the hardest part is you can't feed them before so you're just bouncing him and singing to him and then you pass over your little baby and the surgeons did an amazing job and he's lucky his skin heals pretty well um, and then after um, you can't you can't feed them you have to use uh, I think we had like a little squirt thing that you we fed him with for a little while until it had healed and he had to wear armbands so that his arms were they kind of like this so it's not quite straight but his arms are like this so that he can't scrape or scratch it so probably seven to ten days he had to wear that and so um, that he sort of stopped his uh, thumb sucking habit there never went back and then um, and then after that, he healed really well, went back to um, pumping and bottle feeding. And then the next surgery where they fixed the palate is at one year. So that didn't go quite as smooth. Um, he really, he wouldn't drink water. He wouldn't eat after that. He, there was times where he was quite uncomfortable. Um, we finally got him to have some water by you playing a game with a squirt gun and squirting water in his mouth. Um, but he had to stay in hospital for a little bit longer. He wasn't very excited about the armbands. At that uh, point, it was difficult to get pain meds into him, but we made it through. Um, I think one of the sort of sitting in the hospital room waiting for your baby to get out, you're sitting with all of the other parents who were in hospitals for other surgery, and I was almost embarrassed. <laughs> um, to say why I was there because you're chatting with other parents and they're in for you know brain tumors and like really serious things and and you're just like my baby's gonna be fine like so not a big deal in the in the big picture um, he still does have some surgeries coming up so he just turned five and about six or seven he's got a missing uh, piece to his gum and a missing tooth there so they do a bone graft from the hip and replace it um, before to anchor the teeth before they come in and they do some orthodontics um, sometimes they fix the septum or do some nose um, to help breathing or just for appearance kind of depends on how much they want um, you know and how comfortable with they you know as they're um, you know how they look and how comfortable they are with that um, so some teenagers opt for more I think it's until sort of 22 or something they might have revisions done with that um, but I mean, the teams have been amazing with us um, the midwives were amazing with us um, our families were amazing with us we never had anyone you know everyone was just supportive everyone's reactions were a little bit different which I liked I had some some of my friends cried with me and others were like yeah so not a big deal and it wasn't a big deal but um, you know of course it's it's hard to find out in transition and so sometimes you need someone to cry with you too um, so that's my story. Um, if you guys have any questions about cleft lip and palate or um, questions about my story or you have your own story, I would love to hear your own story. And if you think that someone would benefit from hearing the story, please share it with them.